Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Using Benchmarking Data in Your Practice. I have a few housekeeping notes to review before we get started. Uh, first, participants have audio access only during the webinar. That means you're able to listen to the presenters, but you can't speak to them or to other attendees. Secondly, your questions are welcome on this webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box in your GoToWebinar panel at any time during the presentation, and then our speakers will take some time at the end to address all the questions. And now I'd like to take a, take a moment to thank Nuance. Their sponsorship is vital in ensuring that AAOE continues to bring members free, high-quality educational offerings. Um, everyone, please welcome Rhonda from Nuance. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for um, having us uh, attend and, and help sponsor such a great event today. Um, by now, I'm sure that you have had a chance to start looking at your benchmarking survey data. and. Um, look at how it's going to be, and I know that there's a benchmark council that will provide a bunch of tools and tips and suggestions on how to effectively utilize this data within your practice. Um, but first, we wanted to start out with just um, giving you a little bit of information about who we are from a nuanced healthcare perspective and what we do to help work with um, physicians in the ambulatory and acute settings, so in the orthopedics in particular. Um, with making sure that they are able to provide quality patient care um, and effectively utilize technology and services um, in their day-to-day -day activities. So with Nuance Healthcare Solutions, we really cover a gamut of areas, um, and we have in technology and services wrapped around documentation capture solutions, which some of you may have heard of as, as Dragon Medical. Um, we've got in revenue integrity solutions, quality management solutions, diagnostic solutions, and um, something that's fairly new um, to our organization is truly an optimization services, um, which we help with driving um, value and added education and enablement to our um, clients. So that's kind of who we are and, and how we cover things. Um, and so one of the things, since we are looking at analytics, we wanted to show you just a simple example of one of the tools that we have within our Dragon Medical um, suite, which is our Dragon Medical Analytics. Um, and within the system, as users are um, trying to, our system administrators are trying to track and really understand how their clinicians are utilizing Dragon Medical, we provide them with an online um, tool that allows them to take um, a glance into how their, their users are um, trending um, in hours of usage, when they're using it the most, as well as what kind of um, depth of information are they using and what type of functionality are they using, such as um, voice command usage and auto text. Um, and all of that provides them a good idea as well as how well the physicians and clinicians are utilizing the system so that they can go back and pinpoint ways to advance or to help those struggling and, and really use the power that Dragon Medical brings to the table. And I mentioned previously um, that this is just one of the ways um, we have analytics within all of our um, products and solutions. And, and many times we use those in ways to effectively pinpoint how we can help um, clinicians uh, work effectively so that we utilize the data in many different avenues. And one example is a project we just finished with an orthopedic group specifically where we were evaluating their use of EPIC. Um, and the tools that they used. And what we found is um, with our optimization services and our knowledge of EPIC, not only were we able to help them advance using Dragon Medical, but we were also able to help them identify some build changes and actually do the build changes within EPIC for them. Um, and an example of what that came out with is where we had orthopedics struggling um, to put in PT orders um, and it was taking them 15 clicks at least and, and numerous ways of having to key in the PT order name and the provider name, we were actually able to make that change, do some education and training with the orthopedics uh, group, and we were now able to create the ability to sync up that build um, and have the PT orders created with three clicks. So it's a pretty significant efficiency that we were able to drive, and we did that by utilizing tools like Dragon Medical Analytics and tools out of Epic to really give that value add to our um, clinicians. So overall, some of the outcomes that we're able to drive across the organization and our product suites is we really look at um, these buckets, which is improving the physician and care team experience, helping drive some financial integrity, 
the quality and compliance and, and all of that leading to obviously improving the patient experience and how do we help physicians really um, put their focus back on the patient and make sure that they're able to really effectively um, provide that care. And so with that, that's my summary of Nuance and how we help to um, hopefully drive some great outcomes in your organization. And with that, I will turn it over for um, the review of the benchmarking um, survey and data and have the council take it away. Thank you, Rhonda. And again, thank you to Nuance for your support of AAOE's educational offering. Um, now I would like to welcome our speakers on today's webinar. Um, we're going to have each one of the presenters introduce themselves, um, and we'll start with Chad Saxon. Well, good morning and afternoon, depending on where you're calling in. My name is Chad Sackman. I'm the COO of Signature Medical Group. We're a multi-specialty group in St. Louis, Kansas City, and we have about 62 orthopedic physicians. I've been on the benchmarking and data analytic council for about three to four years now. Yeah, I'm uh, Chris Greenman. I'm, oh, sorry. Uh, Chris Greenman with uh, Tau Fracture Orthopedic Medical Clinic um, in Northern Nevada, uh, California as well. We have about 25 providers and I have been on the committee for about three years. This is uh, Terrence Rosenthal. I'm the administrator for the orthopedic clinic in Opelika, Alabama. I um, have seven docs and two mid-levels and this is my first year on the council. And this is Tom Witt. I'm the Chief of Operations at Winchester Orthopedic in Virginia. We have five physicians, five mid-levels, and I've been on the council for one year. Right, and I am Vicki Sprague. I'm the Director of Data Solutions for AAOE, um, and I've been in this role for about two years. Okay, so this is, I think we'll break this up to go over quickly the objectives. My name's Chad, and I'm going to go over the objectives, um, the introduction of kind of the portal and how to use it and some of the new things, features that are in there. Uh, we'll go over some core reports, and then the last section really is just a, a panel to kind of discuss how and, and you can use these reports in your practice, what reports are helpful, um, what, <clears throat> what data you can use to collect it. So the objectives really for today is to analyze the data that's available in the portal. There's a a wealth of knowledge and information in there, um, and we'll kind of review what opportunities are there. Um, select benchmarking results that help you make decisions, and then utilize it, um, how to utilize the data in front of your physicians and your management team. <clears throat> so this is, uh, how do you get to the data? You can get to it with this web, web address, aoe.net forward slash benchmarking, that'll get you into the portal. Uh, once you get into the portal, um, you have an option. This is what the this, this slide looks like to get into the portal. Just a reminder, when you get in here, it'll give you the option to purchase it or log in. If you participate, remember if you participate in the program, you get free access to this. But if you didn't participate this year or you have a colleague that didn't, um, they can purchase the, the portal access as well. Um, so once you log in through this portal here, your first screen on the right, um, in the blue area, it kind of breaks it up. You've got your home page. You've got where you can view the core reports. The core reports, the council kind of developed these reports years ago because there's so much data. It kind of narrowed down what we, we termed as 18 very important um, reports that could help you address most of the issues that us as administrators of orthopedic practices um, deal with. And later, we'll kind of go into those in a little more detail. You've got the review reports, which is an area where you can review all of the reports, um, you know, numerous reports beyond the 18 reports. The document library is actually, there's a user guide in there to help you kind of, that you can download to help, download to help you um, navigate the, the portal as well. You've got contact information where you can get a hold of us at the council or Vicki if you have questions about the reports. Um, and obviously your profile and password. The results, <clears throat> the benchmarking survey really is a combination of major areas. You've got revenue and expenses, which obviously is, is a major conversation. Productivity, overhead, um, you've got your provider compensation, both for their compensation in the practice and total compensation. Um, practice administrator compensation, and that's broken down by different titles as well. So for the larger groups, you can have your CFO, COO. 
CEO, um, employees, FTE ratios, you've got square footage, um, which is always a strategic conversation when you're looking to expand, um, accounts receivable, x-ray, ancillary services, and we have some recruitment data as well um, with the competitive market of recruiting orthopedic surgeons. The profile here, this is a slide just breaking down what's in the, in the portal. Um, the, one of the things with AOE is it's a substantially large benchmarking um, opportunity specifically for orthopedics. It represents, in this portal, we have over 250 um, practices, over 7,000 physicians, over 3,000 mid-levels. Um, the pie chart on the right is a breakdown of the practice sizes. This is a good representation of AOE. Uh, so you can see for a group of one to five physicians, 17% are represented in this portal. Um, you've got group sizes from six to 12, 13 to 20, and then greater than 20. So um, you are able to really do some comparison based off your practice size as well. Um, and here is the regions. So again, one of the things we, we focus on is every market's unique based on the region. The West Coast is different than the East Coast and the Midwest. So you're able to filter down to your region level. This kind of shows a representation. And again, we have practices from everywhere, including Alaska in, in this survey. One of the one of the real things that we've, we've been proud of as a council is let's getting trend data in here and getting a portion. So uh, where you can actually look at your, your results and the national trend over several years. Um, at this point, the portal has three years worth of data, 2014, 15, and 16. So if you participate in all three years, you'll have a three-year trend. Um, you can see we've had different participation. In 2014, we had 142 groups participate. 2015, uh, down a little bit to 126. And last year, we were up to 178. So we're really proud of that growth and encourage everyone to continue to participate because this is a great tool for us as healthcare administrators. Um, like I said earlier, you're able to filter, and I think that's what's unique about this, pro this participation or survey is you can you can break it down different years. You can go to the survey period, which you can break down just looking at 14 or 15 or 16. You can break it down to the practice sizes that we, we kind of did showed in that pie chart. Uh, you can really look at subspecialties, so you could look at foot and ankle versus total joint. Um, and you could break that down to the population of the city you live in or the region. Um, that you were represented, so you can get a good apples to apples comparison. Let's see. So, and this this is what most of the reports look like when when you when you select the reports. Uh, the turquoise or blue, however you want to call that, is the industry average. Um, this data doesn't have the my practice, but you have your my practice data to compare year to year. Um, and then you've got the the uh, percentiles, the 25th median, 75th, and 95th percentile to, um, to pull the data out and look at it and compare it. Uh, when you have your my practice, this is what it looks like. The black would be your my practice, and then you've got your percentiles, and it shows on the right, it shows kind of where you fall within the percentiles for, for your participation. <clears throat> And then if you hover over these, you can actually identify the values because sometimes graphs are great, but sometimes you want to actually see what the exact dollar amount is. So you can hover over it and this will show up and you can get more details for your, for your information. And then another thing we added is the three dots up there in the upper left corner, right below C data. It's kind of hard to see. If you click on those, you'll get a couple options. This first one shows is show data. So this will show your data, the, the industry data and your data, and then you can actually see the numbers down below. This is helpful for some of us who want to present that at board level and have the data, the numbers, the hard numbers to show. Um, you can copy this, you can snip this into a PowerPoint and take it to your board meeting or your position meetings. This next, this is under those three dots as well. This is called the spotlight. So this kind of gives just a, a cleaner view of the, uh, of the the graphic, the, the chart. So again, you can copy paste this into your PowerPoint for your, for your So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Chris, and he's going to go over the 18 core report in a little more detail. Uh, so Chris? Yeah, thanks, Chad. Uh, Chris Greenman here. We're going to talk about some of these uh, core reports and why we thought these were important uh, reports. Some of the slides are going to be self-explanatory as to why they're going to be, you know, why they're important. Um, but we're going to we're going to go through these kind of quickly in hopes that uh, there's time left over 
for uh, you know the panel discussion. So the first one being revenue, you know, I think that's pretty clear. The importance of you know the money coming in to the clinic. Um, next, productivity can be measured in a number of ways. Um, you know, you have the office visits per FTE physician, uh, surgical cases, um, surgeries per new visit is an interesting one as well. How efficient are those uh, surgeries? Um, work RVUs per FTE physician, revenue per worked RVU. So all these represent different ways we can show the productivity of the uh, provider. Compensation, um, I, you know, a lot of times docs are interested in this. Uh, mine certainly are. So this is an important number to look at and to be mindful of in comparison and to understand, you know, what all that entails and includes as well. Um, that the rest of us should be um, someone interested in is the practice uh, administrator compensation. So you have those trends as well in here. Uh, overhead. Um, you know, the overhead percentage uh, and overhead by FTE physician, I would say probably the percentage in my experience is something that uh, docs talk about amongst each other and it's an, you know, it's an important number. Again, it's important to understand what makes that up, um, you know, as defined by, um, you know, the survey, um, but a very helpful, useful um, uh, number and a ratio to, uh, to have handy. Um, staff cost is a percentage of revenue, FTE staff per FTE physician um, as well when we take a look at uh, our expenses and the staff expenses in comparison to, um, you know, FTE physicians or total revenue to give us a guideline of, uh, you know, where we're at. Are we overstaffed, understaffed? Um, again, a very helpful uh, bit of information in making decisions. Square footage, uh, same thing as far as the space, which, uh, you know, square footage, the, the building expense can be a big uh, expense along with the employee. Are we utilizing that space um, uh, effectively um, and, and the cost of it? Um, another helpful bit of info. Accounts receivable, um, uh, we have the aging. Um, there's also the uh, payer mix as far as the different uh, insurances. Um, now, what's important here is to take a look at the uh, payer mix by charge. For me, I look at that as where do the where do the providers spend their time, and then the payer mix by percentage um, for the net collections is where they get their money, which is often two different things. Um, so we try to use, we try to focus in on the ones that have a higher obviously higher reimbursement and it's a bit a bit uh, bigger bang for the uh, the time spent. Uh, and then I believe lastly the ancillary. So we have a number of X-rays per FTE uh, X-ray technician. This is an interesting way to see how uh, uh, productive the uh, X-ray techs are, how, how busy they are as far as actual x-rays taken, which is, uh, which is quite helpful. Okay, thank you, um, Chris and Chad. Um, so this is Vicki, um, and I'm just going to facilitate the discussion with all our panelists now. Um, I have some questions prepared, and then after we have this discussion, um, we can entertain questions from you as attendees as well. So um, I'd like each of you to um, tell us why should orthopedic practice administrators use benchmarking data? Terrence, would you like to start? Um, sure. Um, I just I feel it's it's so important to be able to to look at the data and compare where you are with other practices, not only in your region but across the country, because we all know that doctor who is going to his CME slash skiing trip next month and he's going to be out there with several of his buddies and he's going to come back and say well you know this is what you know my buddy's making I'm not making that to be able to have the data and show it and to see how you're doing and to identify problems and trends you know we look at trends to see you know trends can spot out where your problems are so it's very important to me to be able to to, to go in there and, and see how we're doing 
uh, like I said, not only locally, but nationally and see, you know, if there's areas we need to improve on, if there's areas we are doing really well in, that I can then, you know, point that out to the physicians so that the sky is not always falling. They see the good along with the bad. That's, that's why I think it's important. Great. Thank you. Tom, how about you? Okay, Chris? Sorry, I had mute. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. I was speaking, but no one was hearing. <laughs> Apologize. So um, I think it's important to be able to compare against others as well. Um, I don't have a formal accounting background that allows me to look at all the reports and easily compare how we're doing um, with other practices and allow me to work on the ones that I, I can see that we're not doing as well on. And just like Terrence said, uh, it's real important because the physicians will come back after they've talked to their, their peers and they always have an opinion and it's real nice to refer back to these reports and actually validate their their thoughts or dispute their thoughts with, with in my case, uh, the overhead percentage has always been a real um, hot topic at our board meetings. So it's been very useful to have national average uh, overhead percentage to, to refer back to. So that's uh, that's where we use it the most. Okay. Chris, what would you add? Um, I, you know, I, I look at this as, uh, it sheds light on you know what what it is that's out there instead of trying to reinvent the wheel every single you know step of the way. Um, it, it's um, for me it's been a you know a, a tool for guiding along these these some of these important decisions. Uh, otherwise, it's just kind of what, what's in your you know kind of gut feeling of things, and you can't you know having actual data of what others are doing. <clears throat> I have found to be um, most helpful. Okay. Chad? Yeah, I mean, essentially everything everybody has said. The only, another thing we do a lot of is look at subspecialties. So we look at, you know, foot and ankles compared to others, and it gives you a good perspective. It's hard to find that data because you, you may only have one or two foot and ankles in your practice. So it gives you perspective from that standpoint. We use it for strategic, strategic planning reasons. We look at comp models. Um, <clears throat> the market trend is something new now that we can, with the trending options on here, it gives us a little more insight of how we've done or how the market's done, have surgical cases per visit, new visits increased or decreased uh, with high deductibles. It, it gives you tools from that standpoint to make strategic decisions. So. Okay, great. Lots of good um, reasons to focus on benchmarking data. Um, can each of you give an example of a decision that was made or avoided because of benchmarking results? So, you know, really, what are the outcomes of using this data in your practice? Chad, would you like to start on this one? Yeah, I mean, recently, you know, obviously, we look at our recruiting needs and what our demands are, um, and we use it from that standpoint. We look at what, you know, there's some areas in here that gives data on, you know, comps for new docs and stuff like that. We're competing with hospitals at times. Um, staffing ratios, I think, is interesting, too, because, you know, a lot of groups are transitioning to scribes or, you know, <clears throat> virtual scribe, dragon, stuff like that, that you can kind of see where you compete, compare um, from that standpoint. So th those are main areas. Obviously, the standard stuff, production and, and productivity um, is areas we use. It's, um, Areas we've, I don't know, you know, specifically we've probably just avoided, um, you know, we use it a lot with the young docs, I think, when we recruit a doc, because they don't really know, you know, am I working hard enough or not hard enough? This other doctor's got, you know, data. He's been in practice for years. Uh, so it kind of helps them kind of get that, you know, here's the ballpark where you want to get to from that standpoint. So. Okay. Chris, do you have an example to share with us? You know, um, yeah, m much of what like Chad said with decisions with uh, from bringing on doctors, um, but also with um, y you know when you have let's say a couple spine doctors or a couple total joint doctors or whatever it may be, you kind of get a sense of a comparison between those two, 
but for some of these guys who are just starting off or the subspecialty that there's just one, as Chad alluded to, it's great to go back and have uh, more information on that. So, uh, you know, we've made decisions based on, you know, the square footage. Um, hey, how can we use our, our space more efficiently and effectively? Um, because we might be on the, um, you know, kind of the median side of um, square footage per, you know, doctor or per, you know, per revenue. Um, ancillaries, we've also made decisions based off the data, uh, whether or not to proceed forward with an ancillary for, um, you know, providing that uh, additional service line. Um, and, uh, you know, holding back on, um, you know, certain decisions as well of, um, you know, when faced with uh, the decision that we have to make. So we use it, we use it frequently. Okay, great. Um, Terry, how about you? Um, you know, a lot of a lot of what what has already been said is, is how we've used it. Obviously, when we're looking at big capital expenditures, such as you know a new MRI unit or or, or new X-ray equipment, you know we're, we're looking at the volumes that are being done nationally versus the volumes we were currently doing on older equipment, and we realized we needed to, to upgrade in in that area. And then, you know, a big one for us is I inherited a practice that was a lot of older physicians and we've gone through a big transition and uh, we were we were trying to figure out what the right size was for our practice. I mean, is it a four provider, five provider, six provider? You know, we looked at the national volumes and, you know, how, how many new patients the average physicians were seeing and, and the volumes and the surgical cases and we used all that data to kind of decide, okay, we probably have the volume, we've been a four man, we probably have the volume to go to a six man. And so based on that, we did it, and it, and it has worked out. We were fortunate, um, you know, that uh, the numbers have held, and we were staying uh, very efficient as a six-man practice. So that was a big decision that it helped us make. That's great. That's a great example. All of those are great examples of how we're using data in our practice. Um, so, Tom, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, what tips do you have for practice administrators when they're sharing the results with physicians? What, what have you done that has really been helpful? Well, I mean, our physicians are very competitive, as I presume most of them are. So any comparison against industry averages or comparison against other physicians really causes action to our group, uh, whether it be you know, elation that they're they're beating or, or exceeding the industry average or what are we going to do to make a change if we're not. So the uh, the competitiveness is, is really been a, a factor in being able to utilize these reports and, and cause action and action at the board meeting level. Okay. Um, Chris, do you have thoughts on this question? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, you know, be mindful of the data that you're sharing uh, as well. You know, in my state, we don't have a high population, and we probably don't have a whole lot of uh, participants, and so I typically don't use um, data just for our state because it's, I, I don't think it's maybe entirely reliable just because we don't have, in all these areas, uh, as many participants to make it statistically significant. So be mindful of that. Be mindful of, um, you know, kind of some of the basis as much as you can be. But, you know, start with, if you're starting off with it, start with some of the basic uh, information. And, you know, the beauty with the surveys is I have found in order for it to be helpful, as, you know, let's say you just go out and buy the survey, you really have to compute all these numbers yourself to know, you know, compensation, work RVUs, whatever else, a lot of this stuff has to be computed for the, the surveys to be of value. So that's that's kind of the beauty of um, actually participating in the survey. And, you know, just pick pick a few topics. You know, you're going to know what they are because your docs are talking about them. And, uh, and you can kind of pinpoint from there. That's great. Great advice. Um, Chad, do you have things to add? Yeah, I think it was, that's a good point Chris brought up. Is most orthopedic groups are already pulling this data for their own internal benchmarking or, or presenting it from physicians to see how they're doing from a financial standpoint. So 
you know, sharing that in the benchmarking data gives you the ability to compare it from a national standpoint. So it's a little extra work to put it into the portal, but it certainly gives you a lot more power. The other thing from how to share it, I would just be, you know, the one thing you have to be real careful on is the filters are a wonderful ability to make it a comparison exactly to your practice, whether it's geographic, regional, practice size. So like in the state of Missouri, physicians aren't allowed to own physical therapy. So if you're looking at total compensation, you know, you may want to, you know, take note that the, it may include physical therapy comp or not. And so you can filter to just do practice compensation. So I think those are those are important things to sharing this data with your physicians and your shareholders. Okay. Great. Terry? Uh, yeah, I would I would definitely echo what was just said because, you know, in Alabama here we don't have a, a surgery center because it's a CON state and it's very difficult to get. And if you if you filter out the information on on physician compensation, you know, for a lot of physicians, uh, surgery center is a large component of that. So I think you do have to kind of not just look at the number and you know say, well, that's the final final number you need to be concerned with. I think you need to understand what all is going into that number. And the other thing is, you know, there's a lot of data out there, and everybody knows their doctors, and some data is going to be more important to some than others. You know, I've, I've mentioned in the council meetings, my doctors do nothing based on RVUs. They, we, we don't look at RVUs at all. Some other practices, that's important. And then, like I said, even within your practice, I can have my doctors come in. I have one doctor. He doesn't care about his dollar amount compared nationally. He wants to know what his overhead percentage is compared to the national average. And then I have another one who comes in. He doesn't care what his overhead is. He wants to know how many dollars he's making compared to the national average. So I think you've got to know your positions, which we all do, and you've got to get the information that they want to see. Because if you overload them with stuff that really doesn't matter, I think it can get overwhelming. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, so you know it, there are lots of sources for benchmarking data um, in healthcare industry as a whole and orthopedics even. So, what do you look for when you're looking for a source of benchmarking data? And you know why why your interest in the AAOE benchmarking results? Chris, you want to start? Yeah, I uh, I've participated in uh, MGMA. I've participated in AOE, of course. Um, but the interesting thing is that um, AOE is more focused towards uh, group practice, private. Um, uh, MGMA, when you look at the data and the participants, it's about 90%, 80 to 90% uh, hospital-based. And so, you know, those, those clinics, although it could be a helpful comparison, uh, a hospital-based clinic versus a private practice, you know, for orthopedics is you're going to be some significant differences. And so for AOE, um, when, then when you take a look at how many people are participating, you know, in the orthopedic side of it, um, you, you start gathering a lot of uh, participants. Thus, the data becomes more significant and uh, more useful. Okay, great. Um, Tom? Yeah, we also participate with another uh, data analytics tool. And it's more focused on the financial and physician productivity side. So it was real nice to see in the AOE benchmarking that they included x-ray, productivity, compensation of the um, administrators, staff costs, overhead, square footage. All those are things that are not covered in some of the other benchmarking tools. So that was real helpful, real nice um, benefit. Okay, great. Um, Terry, how about you? You know, for me, it being, you know, only orthopedics is so helpful because, you know, a lot of the MGMA data we get, at least here in the state of Alabama, is just all specialties. And, you know, there's some there's some specialized staff you have to have in orthopedics that, you know, maybe a OB clinic or someone like that doesn't have to have, you know, x-ray tech, cast tech, things like that. So, you know, having having a, it broken out in just orthopedic practices to me makes it invaluable when you compare it to other people who are looking at um, you know data across a bunch of different specialties that really don't compare to orthopedics. Right, certainly. Um, Chad. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's the it's the gold standard essentially because of the size of participants. When you have 162 orthopedic groups that, like Chris said, are predominantly private, um, it gives you the best comparison that you need to to kind of measure yourself against. Uh, you're not going to find a, a survey that has more. I've used others. We've all used others, and they, some have value, but most of them don't have the sheer volume that this, this survey has. The filters are a wonderful ability. Having the trend report now is just an added. Um, I also think the resources that AOE itself provides. You know, we've got webinars such as this, but we also have web, you know, breakout sessions at the conference. And then, since the addition of you, Vicky, there are resources from AOE as well, if participants have questions about how to navigate the portal, they have questions about how the data was pulled, and for if, if they decide to participate, they've got a resource, whether it's you or the council, to help them you know, figure out how to run this, pull this data out of their PM system to present it. So I think the combination makes the AOE benchmark survey, you know, a very powerful overall. Great. Thank you for all for those insights. Um, so there's probably practices, you know, you know, maybe the attendees probably include people that have participated in benchmarking, have used it before, and others that have never looked at benchmarking data before. So what suggestions do you have for orthopedic practices that are getting started with benchmarking data? What should what should they do first? Um, who wants to start? Terrence? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say kind of like I mentioned before is, you know, there's there's a lot of data out there, and it's all outstanding data uh, in the AAOE uh, reports. But I would start out with the, the things that are important to you and your practice. And, you know, looking at those reports and, and doing your benchmarking on, on things that, like I said, are important to your position and things that you think you do well and things that you think you may need to improve on. And once you have a handle on those things, then you can start maybe looking at some of the more complicated stuff or some of the more involved stuff so you kind of get a handle on, on things. But, um, you know, other than that, just do it. I was a little hesitant at first before before the first time I did it, but the, the information that is provided to us has been invaluable, and the physicians have really liked um, being able to look at things and, and see where they at, where they are at. Um, and see where we're doing well and where we're not, so we can uh, make decisions on the future. So I would say, don't be scared of it. Go after it. Okay, um, Chad. Well, all the data we all have. I mean, it's just a question of organizing. There's no doubt the first year you participate, there's a lot more work. You know, you've got to get yourself set up, get orientated, figure out how to pull the data. Every year after that, it gets easier. We customize some of our own reporting mechanisms we do for practice meetings uh, to match the AOE benchmarking data. We A lot of it already kind of did, uh, but pulling the data I think is, is important. Um, it's finding time, blocking out time to do it, you know, is hard. All of our time is valuable, but, you know, when the year closes, you're doing a lot of this data already, so get it and pull it and push it in there. Uh, and again, if you get stuck or have questions, you know, reach out to the resources. I mean, that's the most important and, and valuable thing is nobody wants you to get stumped. Um, and then the last couple of years, you know, the council took, you know, we, we tried to make this, you know, the, the fight is always how much data or not, or don't ask too much data, don't make it so daunting, but then we want data to be able to have valid points. So um, there's been a customization of reports, so you, you fill out a little survey and uh, It'll, if you don't have MRI, it's not going to ask you questions about MRI or physical therapy. So I think it, it really focuses on what you have in your practice so, so you don't get lost in the weeds trying to find data. You can find data to make right, right, great. Um, Chris? Yeah, oh, great, great comments thus far. Um, I, I would agree also with Terrence specifically of just pinpoint that information that's important. I mean, you know, these. Typically, I have found you know the doctors want a summary of an abstract. I mean, it's just they want very quick points, and um, so it's it's being mindful of again what 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 your needs are and what what's interesting, and then from there, um, you know, like uh, FTEs and all that stuff um, might not need to be presented to them, or it may be, but it's something that an administrator could still use in everyday decision making. Um, yeah, so that's that's. That's the primary. Uh, that's the primary thing. We, you know, I've even um, have changed uh, our financials 
and our um, how we set up our accounts for um, accounts payable to match more of these these surveys. So when we run the reports, they are just right in tune and in line with uh, these survey uh, questions. So I don't have to convert and you know pull numbers out from here and there and everything else. All the departments pretty much line up, and it just makes it a whole lot uh, a whole lot easier. Okay, great. Um, Tom, what do you have to add to this? Well, not much more to add other than it, it's just a great tool to help administrators run their practice. Uh, there's lots of different uh, slices of data in different areas that um, you can refer back to to uh, get answers of where you're at, what you need to work on, and what you're doing well at. So it's just another tool in the toolbox to, uh, to help us uh, run the practice as best as we can. Okay, great. And I'm going to open this up to any of you that want to um, answer this question. Um, what else do you want attendees to know about your experience using benchmarking results that I haven't asked you yet? Any final thoughts? Well, I've um, I've had to train the doctors because they will come back from you know their meetings and everything else, and they try to figure out their own overhead and. You know, it's important to understand when you say overhead, what does that mean? And um, when you say compensation, what does that mean? How does that differ from total compensation? And what, you know, what are the numbers included? What are the ancillaries included? And so I think um, I've, you know, through these years, I've finally had some success of, and then also creating the financials that we hand out each month to represent that and to mimic that, that they, they kind of know, hey, there's more to it than just you know my W2, um, but yeah, I t to me I, I just I would feel you know I'd have my most valuable tool missing if I didn't have the uh, the surveys to work with, and uh, you know practice management. Sure. Do others have thoughts? Yeah, I would like to add that we're not seeing it live here, but it is extremely easy to use, very intuitive. So there's no learning curve on accessing and running the reports. It's pretty straightforward and simple. So shouldn't be any uh, concern there at all. Okay. Anyone else? No, I think for the uh, one thing we didn't probably touch on is it's a good it's a good tool to help when a physician's looking to add a mid level too. So you can kind of benchmark their volume and their production. And, and then look at what what the expectation. Since we do break it out by mid levels, you can look at what a, what the average visits and and, and comp for uh, for the mid levels too. So it's a good tool, especially for a group that may not have a mid level and is thinking about adding a mid level. It gives them some ballpark uh, data to kind of help make that strategic decision. So. Okay. And and I would just um, say to me, there's there's no better source of information um, in orthopedics for for the for revenue and compensation and, and expenses than this at least that I've found and to be able to have that information uh, across the country across your region by practice size it's just an invaluable tool when you're educating your physicians when you're working with them it can be a valuable tool you know for you show what a good job you're doing. As administrators, I think a lot of times people don't think about that with benchmarking is, you know, one way you can prove your worth to the physicians is you say, hey, look how we're doing versus the national average. Um, so to me, it's invaluable in that way. And like I said, just being able to use it to educate physicians, I don't think there's a better source of information out there in orthopedics. Okay, great. Um, do we have any questions from attendees? I haven't seen any come through yet, and again, if anyone has any questions, they can type them in the chat box in the GoToWebinar panel. Okay, well, while you're doing that, there's one question that the panelists here brought up. Is, uh, how, how does the, um, the data, the benchmarking data that we're talking about, when it tie into the data warehouse that AAOE is recently working on launching? 
Yeah, thank you. This is Chad. I think you know, obviously there's been a handful of webinars out for the AOE's transition to have a data warehouse, and and that's really in in response to this whole changing in payment models from fee for service to volume to value. And uh, you know, I think the good news is the the company that that is managing this portal is the same one that AOE selected to run the the data warehouse. So I think that makes it easier to transition. I think this. Um, this, you know, the, the data warehouse will have a repository that you can tie patient satisfaction and patient reported outcomes in there. So, you know, from a from a resource defying information, you could pull up the portals, you could access, you know, national trend, benchmark your patient satisfaction for your physicians, as well as outcomes and tie in their production benchmark, you know, revenue, overhead, stuff like that. So it could give you a complete analysis. Uh, the payer mix part's changing a little bit too, you know, um, because we're asking bundle payment compensation in the payer mix as a breakout now, which wasn't the case when we first started this survey. So I think, you know, I think having the two kind of in the same area allows for a lot of interfacing with, with the changes that we're all facing moving forward. Sure. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. And Vicki, from your standpoint, do you, what are your, what are your thoughts? And you're, yeah, you're, you're integrally involved in both aspects. Yeah, I think I think you stated it well. I think it's just a great opportunity to expand um, the the data that we are able to benchmark. We talked a lot about the, the benchmarking survey and the areas that it includes in terms of productivity and compensation, revenue and expenses. And to be able to look at that side of the practice along with quality, satisfaction, and outcomes is just going to make the data even more powerful. So the ability to be involved in all of that um, within one um, place, within one portal, is going to be very powerful and is really going to be a value for AOE members. So um, definitely um, watch for that. And if you have want any more information, um, reach out and we will be happy to talk with you about that. Any other questions, Amanda? Uh, no, um, no questions yet. Okay, I'll go ahead and put this slide up. Um, it has our contact information on it. And like I said, um, all the members today um, are, are members of the Data Analytics and Benchmarking Council for AAOE. Um, as you know, they represent different practice sizes, um, they, different areas of the country, have different levels of experience with the benchmarking survey and as members of AAOE. So uh, they all have various um, perspectives to provide. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them. Reach Reach out to me at any time with questions. I'd be happy to um, have individual conversations with you about the benchmarking results, uh, how to navigate the portal, how to make the best use of that. And then when you post questions that are better answered by the um, council members, we, I have that as a resource as well. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chad, Chris, Terrence, and Tom for being panel members today. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and thank you again to Nuance for their sponsorship. Um, for more information about AAOE benchmarking results, or if you're interested in purchasing, you can visit www.aaoe.net slash benchmarking, or you can also in email info at aaoe.net. Um, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us for this webinar. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>